Well, the first thing is our Vic City's COVID-19 safety plan has been approved by the board. It's gone to Rowing BC and to Rowing Canada. Um, it's posted on our website. That's a critical piece. We all have to post our, it's a requirement of health, uh, BC Public Health that we post our, our COVID safety plans. It's posted on our website. I haven't yet updated the one that's posted at the boathouse, but I plan to do that in the next little while. So what this means is that rowing and training groups at Vic City is now considered a sanctioned activity, as long as we follow the protocols in our training plan. So we can get started rowing quads. Um, and I stole this next slide basically from Rowing DC and they talk about the objective all the way along is to increase our activity carefully while reducing and mitigating any risk wherever possible. And what's really important about the training group concept is that rowing is actually, we think of it as being low risk because in singles we're far apart, but when we're in a crew, we're actually in close proximity for a prolonged period of time. So that actually puts us in one of the higher risk sports um, because being in you know, prolonged close proximity increases our risk of, of COVID transmission. Okay, so for different, the rules around training groups apply differently in different sports depending on how they're categorized and, and rowing is categorized as a higher risk because of this prolonged proximity. So why are we doing this? Just a little bit of background. I mean, really we're doing it Everyone wants to get back in crew boats and quads or not everyone, but a lot of people, you know, it's just fun rowing quads and bigger boats, but there's some other reasons too. One of it, one of them is safety. So we all know that in the early morning for the adults, um, there's a lot of small boats on the water. It's quite dark out. If we can get more people into bigger boats, reduce the number of boats on the water, it's just a little bit safer um, and allows more effective supervision and coaching. Um, and you know, people are generally speaking more comfortable in the bigger boats as the weather deteriorates and the water gets colder. Um, flexibility, this really applies to the juniors to allow different boatings when athletes are away. So often right now, uh, a double, your double partner can't make it and Katie spends an hour try, trying to rearrange boatings to get people out on the water. It's, it's, uh, so this will allow us some more flexibility and it will allow us to maintain the length of the sessions. Again, this is primarily for the juniors as the days shorten in the evening, the sessions are gonna, it's gonna get harder and harder to get a decent length session in. So by going out in quads, sometimes we can get, we can get people launched and landing faster. So that's why we're considering this. Um, I'm just going to admit someone, here we go. Um, again, a little bit background, we're gonna start slow, um, we've already, I didn't rush to get this plan approved, um, knowing that a lot of the juniors had just gone back to school, numbers in BC were going up. But right now it seems like BC is in a reasonable place. Bonnie Henry said things are level, she feels like things are leveling off slightly. Um, and you know, we've now, juniors have been back in school for at least one incubation period. So things are looking okay. Uh, so I'm just letting people in here. Um, but we're still gonna start slow. So for the juniors for the next little while, most rowing will continue to be in singles and doubles and maybe row quads you know, once or twice a week. Um, junior novices in particular will only row coastal quads. You will not row in racing quads. And that's because we need to minimize it, the risk of flipping. And adults, um, including novices, it, it may vary depending on what group you're in. And so I suggest talking to your specific coach. So I imagine like for the early morning group that rows in the dark, there might be a little bit, we might move to quads more quickly than say maybe the, the Saturday, Sunday afternoon group, but that's, that's gonna be, so it's gonna vary a little bit depending on the group and what, what the group wants to do and what the risks are. Okay, so to get into the kind of nuts and bolts of it, a training group, a training group is a specific group of up to 10 people who may row together in crew boats in any combination. So there could be say eight people, you could row two quads, you could row you know, a quad with person A, B and C on one day and E, F and G on another day, you could row doubles. So it allows that flexibility within your training group, you can row with in any combination, okay? But you may not row with anyone in, with a person in any other training group. Okay, so if your bubble double partner, the person you've been rowing a double with right now is not in your training group, you can't row with them. So your bubble double partner should be in your training group. 
hope that makes sense. What I'm going to do is go through this and then at the end you can ask questions. Um, how, how do you get into a training group? So it's the athlete's choice to be in a training group. There is a risk associated with rowing in a training group in quads. Um, and so people have to be able com feel comfortable with it. You have to assess your own risk. We want you to choose who your training group partners are because you need, there are different factors you need to consider. Like what's the size of your respective bubbles? Do you have high risk family members? Are you, you know, do you catch public transit? Do you catch a school bus? Are you involved in, a, in another sport or another activity where you're around a lot of people? So you know, we can't assess those risks. It, it has to be up to each person to assess the risks and to talk to the, the other people who you're considering being in a training group with. The idea is we want to keep your combined network small. And that's partly to minimize exposure, but a large part of it is actually in the event that someone tests positive is to facilitate efficient contact tracing. You know, Bonnie Henry, again, is always talking about you know, the importance of contact tracing and contact tracing quickly. And to do that, we need to keep our bubble small or our network small. So consider that when you're thinking about who do I want to row um, in a training group with. It's not all just about rowing with your friends or rowing with people you like to row with. It's also about assessing the risk. Um, so once you've decided who you want to have in your training group as a group, um, send an email to your head coach with everybody CC'd, okay? So everybody in the group should be on that email just so the coaches know that everybody's aware. So provide your head coach, so that's Katie, Isolda, and probably Jane with the name, or depending on which group you're in, with the name of the people in your training group. If you need help finding a training group because you, you know, maybe you don't feel comfortable asking people or you don't know people that well, or you don't overlap with people, talk to the head coach and they'll help you set up a training group. For juniors, it's really important that parents know what's going on. And so I'm creating a consent form that we will ask parents to sign and that will list the members of the training group. It's really important that juniors and parents talk about this together to make sure that everybody's comfortable with it. And then a list of training groups will be posted at the boathouse, probably somewhere like inside one of the boat bays, just so everybody knows who's in what groups and it doesn't get confusing. Okay, there are rules around the training group because this idea of being in a training group, it really only applies, it means you, you, um, you don't have, um, how can I say this? It applies on the field of play, okay? So you can be in close contact with people not wearing a mask, only on the field of play. And that means in rowing, only when you're in the boat. At all other times, because you're rowing in a boat in close proximity for a prolonged period of time, which is a high risk thing, when you're not in the boat, you need to actually do things to reduce your risk further. Okay, so you need to be extra careful on land. So that means you have to stay two meters apart at all times when you're, either not sitting in the boat or not carrying the boat, okay? So even though you're in a training group with someone, it doesn't mean you can hang out with them on the tarmac right next to each other. It means we're gonna ask people in training groups to wear a mask while at the boathouse, except for when you're actually sitting in the boat, okay? And just be extra careful about, um, you know, hand washing and equipment cleaning. And we just recommend or encourage you to keep your your networks of close contact small. And yeah, this is just a little bit about risk that I sort of talked about already that it's a high risk activity rowing in a crew boat. So we need to offset that higher risk on the water by doing things off the water that are lower risk. Okay, so two meters apart with everybody, including those in your training group, wear a mask, keep close contact small, be diligent about hand washing. Okay. Just want to talk a little bit about coaches. It was a requirement that any coach, so coaches are not counted as part of the training group. They're separate. And what that means is a coach cannot come within two meters of anyone in the training group. If they do, they're then considered part of that training group and they can't coach anybody else. So it's really important that the coach keeps separate. If by chance they've had to come close to someone to do a rescue or whatever, what it means is that training group then has to essentially go to um, rowing in singles or doubles for 14 days, or the coach can only coach those people. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so just be aware of that because it will limit the coach's ability to provide on water assistance. You know, they can't come over and fix your foot stretchers for you because that means they're now in your training group. Um, if you ask for assistance on the land, please make sure to step away from the coach so that they can do what they need to do in the boat and keep the two meters distance. And every coach who's coach of a training group has had to attend a mandatory rowing BC information session. So all our coach, I think all our coaches have done that. I have to, there were a couple who were missing, but um, by the time we get started, everyone will have done that session. So they're well trained on what the training groups are, what they can do, kind of what the implications are of the whole thing. Um, equipment cleaning. Um, <laughs> Again, stay two meters apart, wear a mask. This applies to when you're cleaning the boat. So I know when we're cleaning, it's easy to get close to someone. Just, you know, so if there's a quad, what I suggest is two people bring the oars up and clean them, two people clean the boat, and probably one person clean one the bow half and another person clean the stern, stern half, okay? And, you know, we tend to get close to each other when we're passing the hose back and forth or the bottle of disinfectant back and forth. So what I suggest is one person rinse the boat and disinfect it. And don't be passing stuff back and forth because that's when we get too close to each other. Um, also remember, you have to keep your distance. If you're in a training group, you also have to keep your distance from other training groups or other people who aren't in a training group. Okay, so these are some of the questions that I think might come up. So what happens if I want to change training groups? It means that everyone in the training group that you're in and that you're moving to must row singles or bubble doubles for the 14 days prior to the change, okay? Um, can athletes who are not in a training group launch at the same time as athletes who are in a training group? So can a quad who's in a training group launch the same time as a double who's not in their training group? Yes, that's fine, as long as you stay two meters apart. And then this is when I talked about, can I row a bubble double with someone who's not in my training group? No, you can't. Okay, so your bubble double should be your training group. And you don't have to row in a training group. That's the other thing. It's, this is your choice. You don't have to. And some people won't because they don't feel comfortable or because it logistically it doesn't work out. That's totally fine. Um, does anyone have, so that's the end of the phase three training group overview. Does anyone have any questions? And I'm happy you can either put them in the chat, I think, or you can just unmute yourself and ask them, which I'd be better with, actually. Any questions? Nope. Seriously, no questions? Okay. Brenda, yeah? Brenda I have a question. Um, just with the training groups, um, are we going to find that what happens is that the coaching groups are going to switch up if you are not in a training group or we just maintain that two meter distance? Um, uh, I'm not sure how it will, because it's a bit of a puzzle, right? So I I don't know how that part will work, work, to be honest. It might depend how many people want to be in training group and what the combinations are. But I don't think it'll necessarily be, well, these people are in a training group and these people aren't. So these people are coached by coach A and these people are coached by coach B. So a coach can coach a quad that's made up of a training group and a double that's not and a single that's not. That's, that's, that's possible. It's that's more a matter of whether the puzzle pieces fit together. <laughs> right yeah yeah that makes sense yeah yeah i just wanted to clear that yeah okay oh so brenda there's a question in the chat <laughs> okay um when do you want us to get the training group list to you by uh you don't send them to me you send them to your coach and <laughs> as soon as you have it figured out so we can start this conceivably tomorrow i think there might be one or two groups who are who might be ready to go um, but as soon as you get your name to the coach, and I think you, they might, you know, dep it depends if your training group is made up of people who are currently in different, different training at different times, that might get complicated. But if your training group is made up of people who you're already rowing at the same time with, it's pretty simple. Um, 
Is there a limit to how many people can be in one training group? 10. 10, okay, thank you. Yeah, and we're actually, 10 is the maximum. Don't feel like you have to have 10. Four is a totally fine for a training group size if that's what you're comfortable with. I think they said 10 because that kind of allows for a, uh, an eight to go out with a coxswain and then kind of one extra. We're, we are not gonna go out in eights right away. I don't think there's a strong reason to. Um, and we don't, the adults don't tend to row eights a lot anyhow. It's fun rowing in an eight, but the risk, I just think of the person in stroke seat in the coxswain and think I wouldn't really wanna be in that position right now. So we're just gonna, we'll just hold off on that for a little bit. It'll happen sometime, but we're not gonna rush it. Any other questions? Well, Renee is asking if the training groups will get uh, cool names. Like yes, that would be brilliant. We would love for the training groups to have cool names so that we can, we can refer to them as a group. That would be lovely. So you, I don't know, maybe people can come up with their own training group name or we could assign names that are like, I don't know, the names of birds or the names of trees or, but maybe you wanna come up with your own name. That would be brilliant. We can even have a contest for the most creative name. Maybe Renee can make us a list. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, anything else? I guess one thing to think about, uh, Brenda, is if you are in a single and you're rowing, of course, with groups that are in quads, your group, the quads are gonna be that much faster than some singles, um, yeah. it may just automatically switch up the group slightly. Yeah. 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 And that's sort of a coaching question. I, I'm not the person to yeah. answer okay. that one. So for that kind of thing, you need to talk to Isolde or Jane or for the juniors, Katie. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'm just gonna move on. Um, just a few reminders as we move into the fall. I know we've all heard them a gazillion times, but we do, from what I see on the tarmac, we do still need reminding of some of these things. So stay home if you're ill. That's, I think everyone's been pretty good about that. Big spaces, few space, big spaces, few faces. Stay two meters apart. We're getting a bit lackadaisical about that. I think as we become comfortable with, oh, these people are in my bubble, it, it doesn't matter. At the boathouse, please stay two meters apart. And if you're in a training group, that's mandatory. We really encourage that you wear a mask and wash your hands. So um, wash your hands means wash your hands when you get to the boathouse, not wash your hands before you leave your house and then you drive in your car and you happen to stop at the store. So by the time you get to the boathouse, your hands are contaminated again. Wash your hands when you get to the boathouse, okay? Um, okay, there's a few other updates that are coming. So the boat bay capacity, right now the boat bay capacity is two people. In order to allow for people to carry a quad out, we obviously have to increase that. So the capacity now is two people or one crew. Okay, so a quad can go in and bring a boat out, but if there's a single in there, a quad can't go in to bring their boat out. They have to wait for the single to come out. And if there's two quads going out, they both happen to be from the same training group, only one quad at a time, just because we're, it's, it could get too congested. So two people or one, one crew in the bay. Change rooms uh, will be open for changing only. I'm not sure exactly when this will start. It might start something like Monday. You'll, I'll put a notice up. So no showering and no gear storage. Okay, so you have to take your bag into the change room, change, take it out again. Um, and there's maximum five people. So two people in the stalls and then three people in the change area. In the women's, it's kind of segmented that way. And I think in the men's, it works out about the same. So five people in the change room at a time. We thought about different ways so you knew how many were in the change room. And we figured the easiest thing is just open the door and yell and say how many people are in there, okay? Um, wear a mask in the change room while you're changing. And people have asked about the showers. If, if you're hypothermic, if you're cold, if you flip, um, 
you can go into the change room and turn the shower on for emergency purposes. Okay. When you're hypothermic, you actually don't want to stand under the shower anyhow. That's not what you, but what you do is you turn the shower on and breathe in the steam. That's okay to do in an emergency. So the showers are not available for showering, but they are available for emergencies. Um, the upstairs, the lounge remains closed except for authorized staff. So that's the site coordinator, me and, um, you know, the staff who work on site, people like Trisha McBride may, may be up there from time to time. The offices are open for people to work in now, one person per office. And um, this isn't really relevant to most people here, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I still plan to work off site just because I've got my computer set up at home and I can't, I can't go back and forth. So I'm probably going to continue to do what I'm doing where I'm doing most of my work at home and I go to the boathouse periodically. I'm not going to do much work for my office. The Spracklin room will be open for low intensity stuff. So warming up, core and mobility, stuff where you're not breathing hard. So if you wanted to go up there before your row and do a bit of a warm up, that's okay. Um, it's maximum of 12 people, stay two meters apart, wear a mask, bring your own mat, um, and then spray and wipe the floor and the mat before and after, okay? You cannot use the ergs, the bikes, the balls, any of the equipment in there, it'll be off limits. The other thing is we're not giving the code out. So the coaches will have the code and this use of the Spracklin room is with coach supervision. So for example, the adults, if you wanna go up there and warm up before your row, you'll have to ask a coach to open it up for you. But I don't know how many people do that. Um, yeah. Are there any questions about that? These kind of facility updates? Brenda, there was one more question about the training groups. Sure. Should we do that later or? No, we can do it now. There was a question. Um, if my husband is novice and I row double with him, could he, uh, um, wait, could he consider a part of a training group if he's, um, if there's space in the group? I think that works as long as he doesn't row with anyone who's not in the training group, right? So, so for example, there could be a, I can, I can, I'm thinking it's, I'm thinking this through as I talk. So someone correct, who's been on the rowing BC session, correct me if I'm wrong. Say there could be six people in that training group, four of them are in a, the quad, and then there's the two people in the double or something. Or maybe there's four people in the training group. It includes one of the people in the double. No, five people in a training group, one of them in a double. The person in the, I think so, can I say work? I think it's just he would just be part of a training group and everyone yeah. in the training group should be aware of that. Yeah, he would be part of the training group, but he wouldn't necessarily roll in the quad. Yeah, so you don't have he to wouldn't roll with anyone else. Hmm? So you don't have to row in, in a big boat to be part of the training group. If you row in a double, as long as the training group in total doesn't get bigger. Yes. It's yes. okay. Yes, I think that makes sense. Okay. I hope when, I didn't confuse you more by the answer. <laughs> yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. I thought it was you, and yeah, we that that would work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brenda, I was wondering when the uh, septic field is the septic field is going to be fixed for the washrooms. Uh, uh, I wish I knew. There's. Uh, um. I was getting, I got about three different opinions as to what the problem was. It's an electrical problem. They are supposed to be fixing it. I'm going to bug them again tomorrow. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping it would be fixed by now. So I need to push them again. Is it, is it the pump, Brenda? It's electrical. Uh, yeah, electric pump. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's yeah. not the pump itself it's the things controlling the pump. Yeah, controller yeah yeah and part of the issue is the person who did the electrical work is no longer with that then it was subcontracted and they don't use that electrician anymore so there's some of the issue okay but i will follow up with them tomorrow i'm just gonna write myself a note okay um, there is another question in the chat mm -hmm. If it's possible to put up a divider in the Spreckling room to allow people to change in there. 
Yes, we yeah. did talk about that, but then that would preclude using the Spraken room for these other things. So the decision was to allow five people into the change room at a time to change, and then that would allow us to use the full Spraken room for other activities. I hope that I hope that makes sense. It's better than it was. Yeah, I know it's not ideal. Um, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, these are just some things, some questions. This was making my mind explode a little bit about two weeks ago. So I really, we had a talk with Wayne Gasquire, and thank you very much, Wayne about, I don't know if he's here, but about what do we do when someone tests positive or someone's, someone is symptomatic or someone's roommate is symptomatic or it was just making my head explode. So we got a few guidelines. So what to do if I'm symptomatic for COVID? Okay, the first thing is stay away from the boathouse. The answers to these are all quite similar. Contact the call center. The call center phone number is, um, posted at the boathouse, posted in our safety plan, Wayne suggested having it on your cell phone, okay? And follow the directions of public health. They'll tell you what to do and they'll tell us what to do. We don't need to think about it, they'll tell us. If you're unwell, but you don't have COVID, like you've gone and been tested um, and you came back negative, we still say, stay away from the boathouse until you're feeling better, just so you don't spread your infection around to everyone else and make them have to go and get tested because they don't know whether they've got a cold or COVID. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to wait until you're, if you've got a cold, you don't necessarily have to wait until it's completely gone, but until you're not going to spread it around to other people. Okay, what to do if you test positive? Follow the directions of public health authorities and please contact me. I imagine that if you test positive, the public health authorities will contact me, but we'd like you to do it as well. What if I'm a close contact of someone who is symptomatic? Okay, they haven't tested positive, they've just got symptoms. So follow the directions of the public health authority. So presumably if they're symptomatic, they're, they've gone and got tested, public health will tell them what to do. Stay away from the boathouse until your, con the, your contact has their result and it's negative and self-monitor for symptoms. Okay, I think those are the main cases. Okay, um, are there any questions about those? I hope I haven't confused people more. Okay, okay. Any other questions about anything? I was just wondering, Brenda, um, that you mentioned the, um, the part, like the relation to the coaches and um, what it would mean for the training group. You mentioned that? Okay, sorry, yeah. I yeah. missed that part. Yeah, that if, if the coach comes within two meters, they're either considered part of the training group and can't coach anyone else, or the whole training group has to row singles and doubles for the next 14 days. Um, and we could, you know, those are actually two options. And so what we're telling the coaches is if you get within two meters of people in a training group to tell your supervisor and then together agree on what the best course of action is, whether it's to, okay, you're just now part of that training group or whether it's that the whole training group goes back to rolling singles for a couple of weeks. Okay. Brenda, I have an unrelated, somewhat unrelated question. How do we finish our non-contact shopping for our bat logic uh, plates and things like that? You said they were around the boathouse. Um, are they oh. going to be left somewhere we can pick them up without having to come within two meters of you? <laughs> I'm not part, of, oh no, I will be part of a training group actually. Um, um, I will be at the boathouse on Saturday morning. Are you okay to, I'm get, getting Julie hers on Saturday morning. Oh, sure. All yeah. right. So I'll be there right. Saturday morning doing the time trial. All right, so we can figure it out without having to go upstairs into your spaces. Yeah, yeah, we okay. better, better not to. Like I could get the site coordinators to bring them down, but if you can wait till Saturday, it's just easier for everyone if I do it. Yep. Okay. Is there anybody who doesn't have shoes yet? Well, I will after Saturday when I get yeah, the equipment. Right. If there's anybody who doesn't have shoes, you're a member of the club and you haven't yet been assigned shoes, please send me an email. 
If you're a member of the novice group and you only ever row a coastal boat, I may not assign you shoes because you don't really need them at this point. And if you have a pair of shoes that's way too big for you, the club just bought a bunch of size nines and I have some extras. So if you would like to change your shoes for a smaller size, you can send me an email. Okay, that's it. Any other questions? This is your last chance. Oh, uh, one more thing. Um, for This is for the adults. We do have um, an annual safety meeting we have to do. I'll probably schedule that for next week. We'll do it by Zoom, same kind of format in the evening, probably like a 7.30 to 8.30 time spot. Okay. Okay.